So with Multijet Fusion, uh, one of the things that we did that was unique was we announced the product two years before we were planning to bring the product into the market. Now people would ask, why in the world would you do that? Uh, you give your competitors a lot of time to prepare. But in all reality, in this space, it's so nascent, it's so early in development that we felt it was vitally important that the ecosystem of solution providers had enough lead time to prepare. And a couple of the places where this was very important was around materials and around workflow solutions. Um, there's a lot of the elements that we will do with Multijet Fusion, but there's a lot of elements that we won't do and others will need to support. Yeah, so for Multijet Fusion right now, uh, our plans are to have products in the market in the second half of 2016. Um, having said that, uh, we work very closely with customers. We integrate them so tightly that they come in sometimes, we'll test parts, uh, and we'll be working closely with us to validate the performance long before we have the products in the market. Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, one of the things that we emphasize in our strategy is that we want to be able to provide form, fit, and function, all three without requiring a trade-off. To deliver on that required a different kind of a technology approach. And so uh, with ours, uh, one of the things that we were able to demonstrate is the ability to support using thermoplastics in a way that is very, very uh, strong in terms of mechanical integrity. So strong, in fact, that we lifted a car with a chain link that was about this big. Um, you can find it on YouTube if you look for it. Um, and in addition to that, what we also see with this technology is the ability to move beyond this idea. So we bring 30 years of printing heritage, the tremendous depth and color capabilities. So one of the things that we'll do in the future, after the first product, not the first product, uh, is that we will bring in the ability to uh, print in color as well. Not just on the surface, but actually all the way through the volume. And one of the reasons we can't offer that right away is because there's really no workflow solution for that today. And so again, this is why it's important for us to partner with the uh, uh, design tool and, and software providers um, so that they can uh, provide solutions that take full advantage of that technology. This is, well, it's an interesting question because in some cases we talk to companies that just do mechanical engineering prototyping and they say, mm, no, one color, right? And it kind of goes back to Henry Ford, any color you want as long as it's black. Um, and what did we see happen over time, of course, is that everybody wants everything personalized, customized. And I think these drivers that drove traditional printing into the highest fidelity color uh, we'll do the same uh, in this space. It's a great analogy to think of. Uh, in the beginning, um, printing was done, even with inkjet, was done with one color. Uh, and so you printed characters, and so people thought, why would I ever need color? I'm printing characters. The best thing to have is the highest contrast ratio. Now, over time, of course, we see what happens. Everybody's printing wall art and building wraps, and uh, color is everywhere. It's a, an incredibly important part of communication, and 3D printing will be no different. Ah, productivity, so uh, those that um, don't know my heritage, I spent the last eight years building another business in HP which was focused on building uh, very high volume production systems for print manufacturing. Um, the, to give you a sense of these systems, they print one ton rolls of paper at uh, about 250 meters a minute. Um, and so this is very high volume production. This is really what was necessary in order for digital production to move into the mainstream. Uh, the volumes that are done in traditional manufacturing today are just so many orders of magnitude greater than the production capabilities of today's devices you need a technology that can scale up um, and deliver on the promise of mass customization, where you get the scale benefits of traditional processes, but all of the benefits of digital, where you get personalization, customization, et cetera. For us, this is a critical part of what we bring. Uh, the quality needs to be there, the economics need to be there, 
and the reliability and the robustness need to be there. For us, that's the magic formula for how we want to drive improvements in the industry. Well, one of the things that we do really, really well is partner. Uh, we have been working in lots and lots of different businesses. We know how to build the kind of the infrastructure uh, to do that effectively and efficiently. Uh, we also know how to build channels, um, value-added reseller networks, um, and maybe one of the most important things is um, that we are quite good at uh, developing and supporting standards, consortia, um, things that uh, help the industry advance and get over hurdles. Um, one subtle thing that we bring that I think may be extremely important is we bring a company the scale and substance of HP into this space. And by virtue of that, that will make other companies more confident that if they make investments into this space, there will be a market there to participate in. Yeah, so an interesting development in HP is something that we call blended reality. And with blended reality, the idea is that we want to make things as easy as possible to move into digital form and move out of digital form into physical form. What we've been talking about today is getting into the physical form, but we have another um, organization that's focused on bringing a really immersive computing experience called Sprout. And the idea is that the future of design needs to move beyond the keyboard and the mouse. And so uh, the initial product was focused, I would say, a little bit in the, maybe the maker space. Um, but you could imagine as we build out our portfolio of technology on the 3D printing side, they will continue to build out a portfolio as well. The other thing is that on both sides, we both need partner networks um, to help build out uh, the full capability and the potential of the market. Uh, no, I have no question in my mind. Um, the truth of the matter is both, right? So there has been hype. And hype happens when people come to look at something and they have an uh, inaccurate understanding of what's possible now. Um, but I also think it's real. And we can say that it's real because if you look at it underneath, 3D printing is the idea of digitization, right? When you move things into ones and zeros, they're in their most flexible form, their most malleable, optimizable, transmittable, all the abols. Um, and as a result of that, that is when it's most powerful. Um, that is a trend that is played out in uh, video, uh, television, movies, books. That same dynamic is going to roll through the, uh, the production of uh, tangible goods as well. Uh, and we have participated in that in certain markets. We've seen what's necessary for it to happen. We know what will be necessary and we both have the assets, but we also know how to power, partner to make things happen. So there's no question about if it will happen. The question is when it will happen. And, and this one, I don't have an answer for you. Sorry for that. But we're working very hard to understand it, very hard.